I am Catherine Druckmann. I think, oh, did I, do I have a slide? That it, no, I don't. I don't have a vanity slide. It's at the end. So I'm Catherine Druckmann. I am an open source security evangelist at Intel. And I am here to talk to you about consuming open source software. We'll go into a little bit more about what that means. So, but today I just want to give an overview of what we're going to cover. We're going to cover what the challenges are. Like, why is it so difficult? What's interesting about open source software that may make it a little bit more challenging to maintain our security posture? Um, and then we're going to talk about how to evaluate the open source projects that we use and then also ingest. Uh, we're going to go over the uh, concepts of project health, governance, um, management, and community. And then we're going to share some tools. And then we're going to do a little, we're going to go through a little demo, an exercise of evaluating a piece of software ourselves. Uh, and then I really want to mention this one right here, the OpenSSF. Uh, I see a few familiar OpenSSF faces in the audience, so thank you. But yeah, I want to talk a little bit about community efforts to come together to solve a lot of these tough problems in open source security. And then how you can all contribute, we can contribute together and make it all a safer and better place. Why is this not working? Cool. Uh, well, cool, I guess my remote's gonna stop working. Um, so yeah, so why is open source security so challenging? Um, so let's start with, with uh, acknowledging the facts here, right? Um, according to the Linux Foundation in 2022, 70 to 90% of even any given software is made up of open source components. This surprises a lot of people. Um, and then a synopsis report showed um, uh, that 96% uh, that of code bases and 77% within those code bases are open source. So the, the statistics across multiple organizations are all lining up. It is everywhere, right? Uh, open source uh, software won. We won. We've been having this conversation. I've been having this conversation over 20 years or so, and some of us have been having it longer, but we won. We're on the other side of it. But what does that mean? Here's an example. It's a bit, um, it's a lot. <laughs> so this is the NPM uh, ecosystem. You can see on the graph, in, in June of 2019, the N NPM package manager reached a million releases, a million p individual tag pieces of software as of 2019. But by 2022, it was already 3.6 million. That's kind of mind boggling. Um, this, by the way, is from an excellent blog post. I have linked, and you know, there's a QR code at the end. Um, it is by a guy named Josh Bressers, who you might see around the open source community. He has a great open source security podcast, by the way. Um, but yeah, so he, he pulled together some of this, this research, and it's quite interesting. Um, again, the NPM ecosystem shows us something else. It's a great example of the massive proliferation of single maintainer projects. This graph is even hard to read, right? Like it's all <laughs> completely weighted over here on the left. Like there's a little long tail of, of, uh, of more mature projects that have a, a, a larger community and many maintainers and supporters. But, but look at that. It's kind of like I, you can barely see it. It's a little tiny toll line. Um, again, from Josh's blog, but really good stuff to think about. I mean, it's not just NPM, right? This is the uh, site called Eco Ecosystems, but it, it shows uh, open source stats. There are massive, massive numbers of new packages released every day. It's enough, honestly, to kind of make your head spin. Like, look at the numbers here, right? I mean, just look at the numbers. How, how could we possibly digest all of this information as human beings? I'm zooming in a little bit just so you can see some numbers. But kind of take that all in a little bit. Think about the number, the, think about the code that you look at every day and the number of packages and, and pieces of software that you contemplate including in your own projects. And then, you know, how do you find them? How do you sift through this, right? Um, so I wanted to talk about something else, something again, back to basics. What is a CVE, right? Um, aside from being a thing that always stressed me out a little bit as, a, as an open source project maintainer uh, and release manager. Um, but it's, it's basically just a list. It's a very important list. Stands for common vulnerabilities and exposures. The standardized way of listing and uniquely numbering uh, known software security issues. Um, and then, but the thing is, it's when, when a CVE is issued for a project that you depend on, you, you probably have to deal with it. So true or false? 
True or false? I'll ask the audience. A project with no CVEs is more secure than a project with many CVEs. Who knows the answer? I'm going to call it false. <laughs> false. You could, that is definitely not an indicator. In fact, I would say that it more likely means a project with no CVEs probably just doesn't have enough eyeballs scrutinizing it. We can find flaws in anything, right? And among those flaws, there is likely to be a little security issue. So, so, so certainly don't use that as an indicator. Here's another one. This is a bit sober, sobering. So in the good old days of even back in 2016, there were, oh, what does it say, 6,000 or so uh, CVEs. But oh gosh, look what's happened over the past several years. And this actually start, stopped last year. Um, I, I don't know what the final count will be for 2024, but that's quite, quite, a, quite an increase there, right? Massively on the rise. So what does that mean? And what does that mean for open source? Obviously, this is not all open source, but some of it is. <laughs> and uh, given how prevalent we just saw open source software is, I think this is significant. And it's something that we all really need to internalize. There's a lot more software also, as we just saw, and the number of eyeballs scrutinizing it is going to make that number go up. Now, this is a larger conversation for another time. Uh, we can talk after class but, uh, about the, the, the ecosystem around this, but it's something to keep in mind. And here's another thing, right? So consider the NPM ecosystem that we just talked about, right? We saw millions of new packages. Um, web applications in particular, by the way, uh, can really get way up there in terms of dependencies. This is actually, by the way, I liked the graphic because it kind of, it, it's a nice visualization of how dependencies might explode, but this is no big deal. This is a few, this is like a handful, a handful of secondary and tertiary nicely uh, visualized, but, but, um, but that's, I mean, it, if you're a maintainer of whatever package this composer file was for, uh, uh, you know, what does that mean for you? as a maintainer to have to kind of keep tabs on all of those things. And this is, I want to just throw this one in there, borrowed this from a former colleague. Uh, this is how bad it could get. This is a, an image from Gatsby. Again, JavaScript, it can, you know, a lot of dependencies. But I'm going to zoom in just on a little section. But, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is a rough, uh, rough th these are rough waters we are sailing in. Um, all of that said, I, you know, I think open source is still the way. This is the way that software gets made. It's the best way that, that software gets made. We should rely on experts and, and benefit from their work. We don't, I mean, I don't want to build a brand new Kubernetes, right? I mean, you, you want to use the stuff that's, that's out there. Um, and ultimately, I think transparency that is inherent to open source software helps uncover all of these bugs that we don't want to uh, let slip through. Now, obviously, you know, I, I mentioned new contributors, and I don't want to imply that new contributors are a problem. That's a great thing, a great problem to have if it is a problem. But that means a lot of new people to educate on security best practices. And, and, and so I really, you know, what I take away from this part is I, I want us to think, you know, collaboratively as a community about how we get people up to speed on the things that we're talking about today. We want to make, we want to make it easier for new contributors, new maintainers, to stay secure, so it has to be that the easy way is the most secure way. So what does it mean? What are we talking about when we say consuming open source software securely? Well, what, I'm coming from the perspective of probably a, a software maintainer, somebody who's releasing their own software and deciding on which projects they want to ingest into their own uh, in order to release as part of their own software. I also mean, to an extent though, I mean even just as users. Anybody here use GIMP, Audacity? Anything else like that? I think we also have to have a careful eye uh, when using open source software generally, even just as end users. So um, I just wanted to quickly kind of rehash the, the kind of the basic steps that we're going to talk about for evaluating open source projects. We want to look at basic health. We want to look at things like governance. We want to look at maintenance and releases and, and how that's done. Uh, we want to see that we want to look at the community behind any given project. Don't underestimate the importance of the human parts of software. Those are just as important as the code, and particularly, and maybe surprisingly, when talking about security. So, so I wanted to ask another question. What is the first thing that you would look at when evaluating an open source project? Anyone, anyone want to be brave and answer the question? Blue shirt. 
I like that. That is definitely, that's a great answer. Okay, behind you in the black. Less commit and less release. Yes, I like that also. Said, said, how many stars? That can be an indicator, sure. Okay, so, so how about this one? <laughs> Is it even, does it even have a maintainer? I, thought, I found this somewhere. Um, it, yeah, help wanted, looking for a maintainer, opened in 2020. I don't know, I, I haven't followed up in the last few weeks to see if they ever found one, but hey, that happens. Um, unmaintained software is a risk. Uh, as we know, software needs continuous maintenance. If it is unmaintained, it is likely to be insecure. Um, when was the last commit? I heard that one. Excellent, excellent answer. Uh, yeah, 10 years ago, probably not a good idea. Uh, that is a big red flag. Um, yeah, look at the issue queue. Again, we heard that one. Um, you know, we wanna look to, to see that there's activity, not only that issues are being reported, but, by, but that they're being responded to. We wanna see that PRs are being closed. Pull requests, sorry, I forgot this is the thing. Uh, but yeah, we wanna see that pull requests are being addressed, issues are being commented on, somebody's paying attention, somebody's minding the store. We want to see again how active it is. Okay, I already saw all that. Um, governance. Governance is important. Something that is frequently overlooked, in my opinion. What is governance, right? The rules, the customs, the, the practices, the things, the processes that go into uh, developing and releasing software. Is there a formal process for that? Do they even have a stated license? This is, this is an indicator. People say, oh, is that a security problem? Well, yeah, it kind of is because a well cared for project is more likely to be a secure project. Uh, so yeah, so it, it was some sort of indication of governance, more than one maintainer. Uh, maintainers from more than one company or organization, that's another really great sign. Now it's all not, it doesn't always happen and there is some software um, out there that, that tends to be weighted in, in one organization or, or a couple organizations. And this is not to say you shouldn't use it, but it, this is all stuff that you really need to think about. We want to know how are decisions made on that project? Is, is anybody just kind of randomly accepting patches and pull requests from anybody they don't know? Um, you know, I think we've seen some stuff in the news about the consequences of that. Um, we want to look at maintenance and releases. We've just talked about that, right? Has there been substantial activity even in the last year? Uh, you'd be surprised how many projects some of us may even rely on today <laughs> that have not had substantial activity in the last year. And, and we wanna make sure we pay attention to that. Look at the release cadence. And this kind of goes to, to governance too a little bit, right? Um, but we wanna see that it's documented. We wanna see it's regularly occurring. <coughs> um, and we wanna see that, that bugs and security issues are addressed pretty quickly. But you know, we also want to see things like when you go back to the customs and the way that the software is made. Like I like to see that there is a very intentional, like a code freeze period. We want to, you know, that releases are not just reactionary; that they're well thought out. The features are not sort of entered at the, you know, snuck in at the last minute. I, you know, there are a lot of things to, con to consider, and a lot of it is kind of subjective and depends on your own needs. Does the project communicate? things uh, with its community pretty, uh, pretty regularly. This is another one. People ask me, well, what, what does having a blog have to do with security? Well, <laughs> it actually kind of does, right? You want to see that a maintainer is engaging with its users. Um, and the maintainer, and when I say a maintainer, I don't necessarily mean a single person again, right? I mean the maintainer community, whoever that is, a group of people, the project, right? You want to see communication. Um, here's a kind of a probably, hopefully obvious one, but needs to be said. Um, is the latest release still in alpha or beta? Now again, I have myself many times uh, ingested software that is in alpha or beta because I needed that feature. I didn't want to build it myself and I went ahead and included it in my project, but I at least did the due diligence to make sure that I knew what I was getting myself into. Um, here's another one, just community engagement. Again, talking about the human aspects that apply to security. Um, you know, are maintainers in the community working, are they putting F emphasis on maintaining a good security practice? Are, you know, are, are, is there work being done to make sure dependencies are up to date? Um, is there contributor documentation? That's another thing. Uh, a contributor guide or absence thereof is some indication of a maturity. You want to see some 
documented way of giving back to the project. And then going back to GitHub stars, that's another good one. You want to, it, ideally, you would want to look at how, you know, how extensively used a project is uh, before you decide whether or not you want to use it yourself. Automated tests, that's an indicator, right? How many times have we uh, decided, oh, this is a great little, great little software package that solves a need for me, but it's not all that well tested. Um, I mean, I, in an ideal world, you have some dev cycles to write the tests yourselves and contribute, and contribute them back to the project, but certainly an absence of those automated tests is something to consider as well. Here's a good one. I, so this is a project near and dear to my heart. A lot of people I know in the open source community got their start with uh, the Drupal community, but this is one great, great community documentation. Now, this is obviously a widely used project and, again, very well documented, but it's something I love to point people to as a really great example of contributor uh, documentation. Oh, it was a video, I forgot, sorry. Yeah, so it's very extensive, very well organized, fantastic example. Um, larger or even medium-sized projects also, hopefully, will have clearly defined processes for submitting security issues, which is also a really fantastic sign. Now, this one is uh, WordPress. WordPress.com. Again, very widely used and mature project, not too worried about WordPress from a security uh, perspective. But this is the kind of thing you want to see. This one is Kubernetes, uh, obviously a great project. Uh, Mastodon, no, this, sorry, this one's GIMP, Mastodon. They all have published uh, security, security policies, and even if a short one is better than none. So hey, now we're on to the good news part of the... <laughs> of the, uh, the talk. So the good news is I've given you all of this kind of information of all of these many, many, many things that we need to think about before we choose to uh, ingest open source software, consume open source software. Um, but the, the good news is that with all of this complexity, um, we do have tools <laughs> that help with all of this. There are some really great folks out there in the community working to solve these problems and make it easier for the rest of, this and our, rest of us, and I'm going to talk about what those tools are. So here's, here's, here's one that I'll get to. So the Intel maintains one called the CVE even tool. Uh, the Open Source Security Foundation maintains a few really excellent uh, tools for this, this type of evaluation. One of them is the best practices badge, really easy to use there, FTC2F. I'm going to get to all these, by the way. And then OpenSSF scorecard. So I quickly want to mention something just because Terry Oda, the maintainer, is fantastic, but also this is a really useful tool. Uh, it's called CVE Ben Tool. I'm not going to go too much into it, but it can be it can be incorporated into your CI CD pipeline. But it can also be as simple as just installing it and scanning a, a project from the command line, and it scans binaries and will give you a nice little report of CVEs. Now, what is that going to tell you? Well, I mean, it gives you a it gives you a chunk of information, and what you do with that information kind of is up to you. But it it gives you a, a visibility into something you would not otherwise have. So I like to mention it. Um, so the other thing, let's get to the good stuff coming from the community. Oh, yes, sorry. Oh, sure. So I can do it for any open source project. I can library in this package or whether it's a product. You can scan any file or folder, and it will pull in whatever data it has available and give you a report. Uh, so I want to plug the OpenSSF just a little bit. Um, thankfully, Intel allows me to spend some of my time uh, participating in this lovely organization. But there are a lot of really fantastic people, uh, a few of them <laughs> are in this room, that are getting together and trying to make this all of the stuff that we just talked about quite a bit easier. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the tools, but I also want to mention just the organization quickly. Um, I'm not actually sure that this is fully up to date, uh, but we can talk about that after class. But there's a, the, the, the main takeaway here is just there's a ton of, of activity going on. There are so many work streams, so many projects, and all of this at the end of the day is to help the rest of us figure it out, right? To help the rest of us who are releasing software to do it well and to do it in the most secure way that the end users can rely on. Um, so here's, here's the first tool that I mentioned. So, so OpenSSF best practices badge, very handy. I checked just before I came in this room, and I, uh, there are over 7,500 projects that are currently listed and currently being scanned. Um, and many of them are 
passing or even better gold or silver status, meaning they adhere to a fairly long list of best practices. So this is a really great first step, I think, um, to checking on the security of a project. If you go to a GitHub page and you see this badge, that is an indicator. It's a very, very simple thing, right? And then if you go and find the project on the best practices uh, badge website, you can drill down a little bit and see like really what that means. What, what is between uh, getting from passing to a silver status? What's between getting passing, uh, passing to a gold status, silver to gold, all of that? And it gives you a ton of information that, that um, is incredibly useful for deciding whether or not to include a project in your software. Um, one of my favorite ones that I like to advocate, and it is something that we use at Intel, is the OpenSSF scorecard. So what is it, right? It's, 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 a, very, it's a checklist, effectively. Um, I feel like I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that it is a bit controversial sometimes. A lot of uh, <laughs> project maintainers don't love the idea of being a, a assigned a report card for their project. Um, I, I, while I understand that, coming from the, uh, the perspective of a person who used to maintain uh, open source software, I fully, fully identify. However, I, you know, for, from my own perspective, I love this. I would have loved to have had this back when I was a maintainer. I think it's fantastic. I, I, but who doesn't, you know, I love a good checklist. Maybe not everybody does, but here's why it's useful to me. Um, I do want to mention uh, it can be used as, as part of a GitHub Actions workflow, and it can be used on the, just as the, on the command line, which I'm going to show you here in a second. So here's what it looks like. Here's the output in the terminal. I want to just I want a quick score for a project. I run it in the terminal, but you can always also um, check out a, a very a list of projects on the OpenSSF scorecard website. There, these are regularly scanned, and so you can see whatever the current score is there. So you don't necessarily have to install it and run it yourself. Um, I also quickly wanted to mention uh, SGC2F, the secure. Uh, supply chain consumption framework. I'm not going to talk about it a lot here, but it is a massive, massive document. And all along the way, um, so it assigns levels. For each of these levels, there are, there's a ton of reference material to improve your uh, software security at various different stages of your supply chain. I encourage everybody to go and check it out, familiarize yourself, um, learn more about it. I think there's some really great work happening here, so I just wanted to make sure to mention it before we go back to scorecard, which is my favorite. Um, so let's, you know, we've talked about all of these things, right? I've, we, I've kind of given you a basic checklist, a basic list of things to check out, to, to pay attention to, but I, I want us to dive in and actually apply these things. So just to kind of recap, we looked at basic health, we looked at governance, we looked at maintenance and releases, and we've looked at the communities behind these projects. Um, and bug reporting. Now we're going to run. We're going to. We're going to then want to run an open SSF, score, SSF scorecard to kind of recap all of that. So first, let's grab a random repo. Um, this is a kind of a fun little tool <laughs> that'll literally just randomly generate any repo. So I, I used it, and I found one called Python Fire. So just as a, a quick check, right? What do we see here? We see that. It has a lot of contributors. Anything else? Anything else look good here? Anyone want to chime in? Uh, yep, I like that too. That's a, that's a pretty big number. And, and, and just the basic thing, right? It has a little bit of documentation, right? It's not just a completely empty repo. Um, so yeah, so oh doesn't have a best practices badge, but we're going to forgive them this time. It may actually now, I'm not sure. But, uh, but that's okay, that's okay. But the rest of it is looking pretty good. So let's look at the issue queue. So what is it, where do we got here? Um, so again, as of the time of grabbing the screenshot, uh, we have an issue that was open a couple weeks ago, no comments, uh, but this one, okay, I took this screenshot a long time ago. So <laughs> this one has a few comments. This one has a few comments. OK, eh, we're not sure. But it looks like something's happening, at least some activity. Um, pull requests. What's happening here? Uh, well, we've got 142 that are closed. We've got more closed that are open. Maybe that's a good sign, right? Maybe. Um, it, 
the number of comments next to each pull request is something interesting, right? This one took 22 comments to get it right. That might be an indicator that people are paying attention. You know, worth looking at, worth drilling down into each of these. Um, but wouldn't it be easy if we could just run a, run a command on the command line and give us all this, <laughs> give us a nice little, nicely packaged answer, right? So let's do that. That's as easy as this, right? Scorecard, give it a repo, and this is what happens. So, sorry, I record everything because I don't trust live demos. So we're gonna have to bear with me and watch the recording. Oh, look at that, okay, cool. We got an answer, we got our answer. So this score is 5.1 out of 10. Do we think that's a good score? It's all right, it's better than some, it's not the worst score. Um, it's not a great score, there are things where they can improve, right? What can they improve on? This one is kind of, uh, this one is a little weird. There's no branch protection, that's pretty low hanging fruit. Like, they, they should probably enable that. Um, the testing, okay. Well, it doesn't have a best practices badge, but we'll forgive them this one time. Um, code review, looks like they're doing a little, a little bit. Solid number of uh, contributors from different organizations, that's promising. But so this is what I like about OpenSSF scorecard. It breaks, uh, it breaks us down into a lot of different areas which kind of allow you to decide what works for you, what's a deal breaker, maybe what you could contribute to if you really want to use this project. Um, so, so yeah, so that's a pretty great one. They're also, uh, again, this is, this is the output in the browser. I'm not sure why the scores are different. I probably, they improved something one week to the next. But still, uh, but here's, here's a, in the web view, it does give you some color coding, right? So it's telling you, okay, it's yellow. So maybe that's kind of a middling score. They could do better, but it's not terrible. Now, the thing is about the scorecard score is that, again, a little bit controversial. What is a good score and what isn't can be a bit subject subjective. It kind of depends on what your needs are as an organization, as a developer. What is a deal breaker for you versus what isn't? But it does empower you with detailed enough information that you can decide quickly without having to spend a ton of ton of time uh, which areas are lacking. So I think it's a very handy tool. I would love to see more people use it. Um, oh, here's another one, I, I, better score. So I thought I'd, you know, I thought I'd, I'd show that. But it still, again, doesn't have, uh, no dangerous workflows, excellent. I also wanted to highlight, which I didn't in the last slide, um, it does also weight all of these different um, sections of the score versus for critical versus uh, things that are less critical. Now again, I mentioned earlier that having a license is very important, but in terms of the scorecard uh, weighting, it is fairly low. It is not a critical security issue to not have a license, although I really, really wouldn't use anything that doesn't. Um, but yeah, so there you go. So there's the scorecard. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to do this part. Uh, so yeah, again, less good and the good. So, what is the takeaway here? <laughs> the good news, again, uh, uh, for in all of this uh, complicated open source world that we live in, is that we get to be our own heroes. We see all of these issues, and we see the complexity, and we see the dangers of um, using unmaintained projects. But the, we can do something about it. This is not proprietary software. We, we don't have to uh, get, a, get a job with a specific company in order to contribute to it, all of these pieces of software. We can just do it ourselves, it's great. Um, if you see things that are lacking in a piece of, piece of software that you wanna use, you can jump into that issue queue. You can fix those things and you can contribute back. If you see documentation that's missing, please contribute that back. Um, but you can also get involved in organizations like the OpenSSF and contribute to building tools like the scorecard. You can contribute to things like S2CQF or the best practices badge, or you can contribute to security education to educate all those great new open source contributors that we now have. And this is kind of where I want to almost leave us before we get to our questions. And that's maybe a little bit of a controversial statement, but at the end of the day, again, we're all open source people here. Maybe we all know this, but 
Um, while there is a social contract, I think, to the open source community, developers at the end of the day don't owe you anything. Maybe, hopefully, hopefully you've paid them and then maybe they do owe you something. But when you're talking about all of the many, many projects that we all rely on to do everything that we do, our phones, our, our work, our transportation systems, all of those things rely at some level on projects that are maintained by volunteers and those people don't owe you anything. So at some level, you have to take ownership. If you ingest it, if you ingest a project into your own, you now own it to an extent. Do not include a dependency that you are not prepared to take ownership of, in my opinion. Now, I know that can be a tall order, but that's why we have all these great tools to help. So yeah, I just kind of want us to think about that. Think about the relationships that we have with the people creating the software that we use. And make sure we're kind of taking care of each other because that's how our software gets taken care of. Um, I wanted to leave you with this lovely QR code. I have links to all of these things, some fantastic articles, some open SSF tools, open SSF art articles, uh, best practices. I have a few other links that are, I think are hopefully pretty useful for in this conversation. And you'll have a PDF of this whole presentation uh, so you can see anything I may have missed. But. And here's where to find me if you need me. Happy to help with anything, uh, happy to talk about being better open source citizens all the time. So with that, I will open it to questions. Oh, I do have stuff to give away. I forgot I mentioned that before I actually started. Um, if you do have a question, I will give you a notebook. <laughs> if I don't know the answer, I'll give you two notebooks. But yeah, um, any questions about, about this, open SSF, anything? Yes, black, black shirt right there. So you raised the question, what is a good code? But doesn't that, to a large extent, depend on how many alternatives you evaluate, for example? That is an excellent on question. your context, how, um, what expectation do you implement? Are you implementing something critical for people to get harmed or something that's just a game? Yeah. Or stuff like that. So. Probably, or also, how how much would it cost for you to implement an alternative in case that there is none? I 100% agree with all of that. Uh, again, I, having been in organizations of all sizes, right? I'll go back to the, the, the day when I was in a very small organization, and you don't have the resources to maybe create a feature that you need, um, and you may have to rely on including a dependency written by somebody else. If you don't have any alternatives, that's exactly, that's this entire conversation, right? You've evaluated it, you've done your due diligence, um, and this is really the only thing that meets your needs. Maybe it's not perfect. This is all part of the, you know, kind of weighing your options here, right? I have many times, I think I mentioned, I have included things that <laughs> were in an alpha <laughs> release stage. And you just, again, that goes back to the don't, taking ownership. You kind of have to accept, I, I think, that you're going to, it's going to be a little bit more of a burden for you, but that's part of the trade-off. It, it, it's a value assessment. If the value of the project is valuable enough for you to put in that extra effort. And that's kind of a risk management. Exactly. Accepting the risk, Accepting the risk uh, based on the return. So yeah, great question. Um, I will give you a notebook. And then I will let uh, Checkered Shirt ask the next question. Yeah, I was, um, I was planning to ask a question anyway, but the notebook out to like create much more incentive. Take a notebook. Uh, so um, there's a recent Tidelift, Tidelift report that came out that oh, says Tidelift. that the number of open source developers under 26, uh, maintainers under 26, is, it's a decreasing curve. Um, what is the impact of that in the overall cluster? Because that is also an excellent question, and please pick a notebook. Um, yeah, so uh, I forgot to plug my podcast. You'll notice I have a, a microphone in my photo. So I actually did a, just did a podcast episode with, with uh, Lewis from Tidelift, and that's a fantastic question. Um, the, again, open source software is everywhere. I can go back to that slide, but you know, we already saw it, right? Open source software is everywhere. It's in everything that we do, everything that we use. We depend on it tremendously in our daily lives. But what happens if it's not sustainable? We love to talk about sustainability of our, uh, our uh, ecosystem in terms of our environment, right? But we, do we talk enough about the sustainability of our software ecosystems? 
In my opinion, organizations need to put a lot more resources, especially open source projects, into training up the next generation, the next rounds of maintainers, the next developers. Um, I spoke with a, a woman from GitHub not too long ago about the, the goal of getting a billion developers, getting so many people, most people on the planet, everybody you know, your neighbors, your neighbors' children, everybody should be tech savvy enough to contribute to the software ecosystem. And it's kind of a weird way to think about the world, but at the end of the day, you kind of, it is that critical. We've decided as humans that we're going to make software that critical in our everyday lives. And if we don't have the actual people to help maintain it and the tools, where are we? So yeah, absolutely, that's a fantastic question. And I don't know, I don't have the answer to that right now. I think there are a lot of really smart people trying to fix that and try to address that issue of having enough maintainers that are you know, 25 years younger than me. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope we solve it. Uh, blue shirt. Yeah. So are there any methods to evaluate project development and annual development basically and don't are there any metrics of new contributions? That is a great question. Um, that I don't know. I feel like uh, I, I so one of the links that I that if you go back to the QR code I have is to the Chaos Project and they do those kind of community metrics. But I will say this, I will say uh, sunsetting an open source project is an art that a few people get right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that, unfortunately. I think that means you get two notebooks. <laughs> oh, also I forgot, I would be, again, remiss if I did not mention, please follow open.intel on LinkedIn. I promised somebody I would say that. We'll have to come back later. Yes, please. Um, I, I promised somebody I would, I would say that, so please follow us on LinkedIn. And then I, you can hear all sorts of things from me and, and my podcast and all the people that I talk to about these very problems, right? The problems of who comes next and, and how do we deal with these projects. Black shirt. Yeah, you know. I just wanted to ask uh, what metrics do you even uh, in a chart like XP? Do you from and like XP attributes? I mean, to an extent, scorecard does, but really, ugh, oh, that's such a hard one. But this is, this is, all of this is exactly that problem, right? I've talked to so many maintainers, so many of the single maintainers that I mentioned, um, who say, this could have been me. Like that could have easily happened to my project. We get burned out. This is another conversation I have a lot. Um, burned out maintainers are a security risk. And what is our responsibility for making sure those maintainers have the support that they need to not be a security risk? Um, I think you know, in terms of having metrics, I think all of the things that I just shared, they, that's, part of the, that's part of the answer. Part of it is keeping tabs on who is, who is contributing to the project, what uh, governance structure they have for adding new maintainers. If the governance structure, the contributor ladder is there in place, you have some protections against those risks. But ultimately, some of these really small projects that are maintained by one or two people, I don't know. And there are a lot of projects <laughs> that are maintained. Exactly, yes, we saw the graph. It's a tiny little skinny, yeah, very tall line. Yeah. That's why they don't follow the security practices. I mean, they are already burned down to the... Exactly. I mean, I will say this. Having these conversations is the first step of solving the problem. Um, I want to make sure to get to your question. Um, maybe taking this question, do you know if Scorecard has been adopted by any project that automates stuff in the pipeline, like or contributes to it or something? Because when you're talking about this um, or looking at this project in an enterprise environment, you're always talking at scale. So if I say to my open source experts, okay, you have to run this command on each of your yes, absolutely. hundreds yes, and the, of the, dependencies, mm -hmm. it's very hard to do this in reality. But yes, you need the short answer is yes. At scale. We use it at Intel. We use it at Intel on a ton of projects. I'm not sure. I think I'm allowed to talk about most of this. <laughs> Ryan said I was. Um, but yes, we use it a ton. We use it on a lot of projects, and we have even been able to, in some cases, auto, like do automatic fixes for some of these issues that automatically improve the scores of our projects. Um, but we absolutely do use it at scale also to evaluate projects. Anyone else? Oh, black shirt. Uh, Everyone has a black shirt, though, by the way. But uh, you know, I was looking at you, so you know. <laughs> That is an excellent question. I would say it's been around a couple of years, as has the OpenSSF. Um, I don't know about trends. I, I think, oh gosh, you may have to 
find me later for an, are we out of notebooks? We've got one, sorry, I would give you two, but for that one, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I would say uh, ping me somewhere on the internet and I will find the answer. Shoot. Thank you. Um, I would also mention before everybody leaves, tomorrow is Sauce Community Day. You can get a lot of those answers tomorrow here in this building. Um, yeah, so OpenSSF has a co located event tomorrow. And yeah, it's a great place where all of the best people in open source security, or at least most of them, will be. So it's a great place to get answers. More answers even than I have. So anyway, thank you all so much for coming. I think we're probably out of time and we're about to get kicked out. But I appreciate all the questions. Thank you.